Do you ever wonder what makes you, you? I mean, we all have a collection of things that we think about ourselves. And then there are things that other people say about us. And then there are things that we've accomplished and done in life. And then there are the other things that we've done in our life that we don't want others to know about. And it's just all a big mess. How can I really know what's true about me? Am I what my children or grandchildren say about me? Or am I what strangers or even my enemies think about me? Am I best defined by my most amazing accomplishments or my worst regret? Now, maybe this is a question that isn't very important to you right now, but at some point it will be. When your career ends unexpectedly or when your family doesn't turn out like you thought it would, or when your life becomes a story that you never saw coming, it is natural to question. What does this mean about me? Is this what my life is gonna be? And who am I in the midst of this? But it could be that it wasn't failure that left you with doubts, it was success. You actually got everything you ever wanted and dreamed of, and at the end of it all, you still felt empty. All the success did not make you feel like a success. Jim Carrey, who at one point in his career was one of the highest paid actors in the world, once said, I think everyone should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so that they can see it's not the answer. So whether it's success or failure or something else entirely that has you questioning, in this video, we are gonna be exploring who we are at the core of our being. And to do that, we are going to look at what Jesus has to say about us. Because throughout this video series, we have been exploring what the words Jesus loves me means for our lives. And today we've come to the final word, me. What does it mean to be me? Stripped of all my successes and failures and what everyone thinks about me. What does it mean that Jesus loves me? And even if you're not sure you believe Jesus is who he says he is, I hope that you'll stick around because here at Community Christian Anywhere, we believe that no matter what you think about God, He can't stop thinking about you. He is for you, and He has a life of meaning and love in mind for you. And it's all centered around us learning how to love everyone always, just as Jesus has loved us. And I am so excited that you're joining us for this journey. Hi, my name is Heidi, and welcome to Community Christian Anywhere. Now, I'll admit, these big existential questions of who am I, they don't feel very useful for someone who has a job and a family and a busy schedule. We can't all be pondering the nature of life and the human mind. Some of us have to work in the morning. So even though I know it probably feels like none of this is very practical, I think it is. Maybe not in the small day-to-day -day activities of grocery shopping and deciding how much screen time your kids should have, but in the big issues, it's impossible to ignore. For example, if I believe life is just some kind of cosmic accident, and so there's nothing special about humanity over any other creature on Earth, I can believe that and still be a kind and caring husband and father. I can still be a responsible neighbor and coworker and member of society. In fact, I just want to say it's pre pretty irresponsible for Christians to say that if you don't believe as we believe, you can't be a kind and caring person. And if you give it some real serious adult thought, you'll see that's not true. But I think on the other hand, if you give it some real adult thought, you can see how the belief that you are nothing more than just a collection of skin and bone and brain chemistry, that's going to affect 
how you think about your enemies or those who wronged you or someone who has different political beliefs and they're offensive or even despicable to you. Because if you take the belief that there's nothing sacred about humanity far enough, then we really are living in an us versus them, the ends justify the means kind of society. And then really, whatever I need to do to protect the good guys or innocent people from the bad guys, well, that's acceptable. But we all know it kind of breaks down eventually because at some point, whatever I need to do to protect innocent people or the good guys leads me to stop being so innocent and one of the good guys, You're right? And there has to be a line somewhere where my ends don't protect me from my means. And once again, you may not spend a lot of time pondering human nature, but you have spent a lot of time thinking about your nature. You've had sleepless nights playing back memories that you wish you could forget and secrets you hope no one finds out about and words you wish you could take back. And you've wondered in those moments, what if I'm not one of the good guys? What if I'm not any better than my worst moments? Because if I'm just the result of a cosmic accident, then I'm not really much more than the collection of my words and my actions. And if the bad outweighs the good, then what am I? And I want to be clear, this isn't about whether or not you believe in evolution as the scientific process that life developed on this planet. I know that since we're a church, you're probably trying to figure out whether we think that you have to believe that the biblical account of creation in Genesis is a play-by-play -play scientific explanation for the creation of the world or not. And so let me say that you don't. You can believe that life was created in a literal six days or millions of years and still be a faithful follower of Jesus. The issue isn't how human life began, but who created humanity and why. Because the why is so important to your life and the biblical account of creation, really of all human history, in my opinion, offers the best explanation for why we exist and how we resolve all the good and evil, all the beauty and pain that exists in our world and in ourselves. The picture we get of creation in the Bible is of a creator God who dearly loves his creation. He pays intimate and detailed attention to every aspect of the universe. And at every turn, he joyfully declares, it is good. Now, this idea was foreign to the ancient world. For ancient peoples, the gods were cold and uncaring and moody. They were not interested in the affairs of this world, nor did they hold any compassion for the creatures that lived here. In most ancient creation stories, the only reason that human beings were created was to be slaves of the gods. And so, Human beings were mostly insignificant in the creation order. And though we may not believe in ancient gods like Zeus or Baal, for many modern people, human beings are still a small, insignificant part of the grand and vast universe that is so cold and uncaring. Carl Sagan, the brilliant astrophysicist and cosmologist who hosted the well-known scientific program Cosmos, once perfectly summed up so many modern people's thoughts about humanity like this. The hard truth seems to be this. We live in a vast and awesome universe in which daily, suns are made and worlds destroyed, where humanity clings to the obscure clod of rock. The significance of our lives and our fragile realm derives from our own wisdom and courage. We are the custodians of life's meaning. But from the very first pages of the Bible, God explains the nature of humanity as being like his own. Unlike other ancient creation narratives, the Hebrew scripture depicts humanity not as slaves created to serve cruel and temperamental gods, but as precious children that were carefully crafted to reflect the image of God and partner with him in ruling his creation. Here's how the Genesis poem of creation describes God's creation of humanity. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. This was a completely new idea to the ancient world. 
Human beings are not insignificant creatures of little more importance than a farm animal, but they are divinely precious creatures made in the image of God. In the ancient world, the only people described as being the image of gods were kings and rulers. And this is why they had authority to rule to whatever degree of cruelty or kindness they decided. Because unlike the rest of humanity that was made to serve, the kings were made in the image of gods themselves. This is how slavery and oppression and violence against women and children were justified. The gods ordained it because the kings ordained it. But the Hebrew scriptures seem to state that all people were made in the image of a good and loving God, male and female, young and old. All people are made in His image, and so all people have inherent dignity and worth because they were all, as the Hebrew scripture put it, knit together in their mother's womb by God Himself. This is the kind of care and attention to detail God put into human beings. He is not distant or disinterested in our lives. He loves us. He wants to partner with us. It was revolutionary then, but it still is today. This means that you are not a mistake. Your life is not insignificant. It is not meaningless. You are made in the good image of the God who loves you more than you could ever imagine. Everything that is good and beautiful about you comes from God, and you were made with a purpose. In the Genesis story, God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Just as ancient kings took their authority to rule from being the image of the gods, the God of the Bible gave authority to humanity, His image, to rule over His creation. God designed us to be co-rulers over creation with Him. He wanted us to take care of this world and one another, and this is one way that we can see we are different than the rest of God's created world. There was a movie that came out in 2012 called Big Miracle. It was the true story of the 1988 international effort to rescue these two gray whales that were trapped in ice near Point Barrow, Alaska. The movie shows how all these environmental groups and the oil industry and the military and the news media and the native peoples of Alaska, they all band together to save these whales. And even though we know there were probably ulterior motives that are at play in this, it's still a very heartwarming tale because there's something in many of us when there are helpless animals in trouble that say, we gotta go save those whales. But the reverse of that is not true. There's never been a time when a little girl has fallen down a well and a group of whales get together and are like, hey guys, did you hear about the little humans trapped in the well? We gotta go save those little humans. You don't ever see whales protesting outside the well like, whales against whales, whales against whales. And I know it's a silly example, but you get my point. Human beings have this desire to care for the beautiful creation God has given us, and it's because it's what we were put here to do. But even more than just animals in nature, we have a desire within us to care for one another. We long to care for those who can't even help us in return. Starving children, people with mental disabilities, our hearts are they're filled with compassion because this is the image of God that has been stamped on us. We know that those who have power and the ability to help, that they should help those who can't help themselves. This is good and beautiful, and it comes from God. So who are you? You are an image bearer of God. You were made in goodness to share His goodness with the world around you. But that's not all that's true about us. We aren't just good and beautiful and filled with a divine purpose. We're also selfish and flawed and broken. We're capable of unspeakable evil and cruelty. We have taken the authority that God gave us to rule and we have used it to dominate and abuse and oppress other people that are also made in God's image. And I'm not just talking about evil dictators or history's worst moments. I'm talking about the evil that exists in a high school cafeteria and in your car as you drive to work, 
and around your kitchen table, talking about the evil that exists in your thoughts and in your words and in what you and I have both done to the people that we love the most. Where does that come from? Is that from God too? No, this one's on us. When you go back to the creation story in Genesis, it becomes clear that God's intention was for humanity to co-rule with God for the good of others. But this was all based on what God's definition of good means. And so God put humans in a garden and he told them to rule with him there. He said, name the animals and care for the creation, live with God, but do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the temptation of this tree isn't just, hey, once you tell me not to do something, I really wanna do it. The temptation here is that I get to decide for myself how to define good and evil. I get to use the power and authority that God has given me to rule, not for the good of others, but for the good of myself, no matter how it affects the good of anyone else. And this is what humanity did. And this was rebellion against God. It was a rejection of his authority to define good, and we took it for ourselves. And this sin brought death and destruction with it, and it has led to all the problems in our world and in our lives. And it's what's led to all the relational dysfunction in our lives as well, because I don't want to just rule my life my way, I kind of want to rule your life my way too. So we use our power to intimidate or manipulate, to force others to give us what we want, or we lie and we cheat and we steal to trick others into getting us what we want. And if we're afraid we won't get what we want, well, then we fight and we scream and we hurt others. And if we feel like we lost getting what we want, well, we take revenge and retaliate and we hold grudges. And every part of our lives has just been corrupted by this sin and desire to rule our lives the way we want and other people's lives the way we want. And all this sin has polluted the good and beautiful image of God in us. We can still see it sometimes, but it's in the midst of the chaos of our broken, sinful nature. And this is why so many of us feel doomed to be nothing more than our worst moments, because it feels impossible to overcome. The bad seems more powerful than the good at times. And that might have been true, if not for Jesus. When Jesus came to our world, he was a completely different kind of human. He was the pure, unpolluted image of God. He was good and beautiful and kind in ways that no one had ever seen or has ever seen since. And he had power and authority that no one could understand. I mean, he had power over creation and disease and even death itself, but he never used this power for his own benefit. He always used it for the good of others. He perfectly embodied the image of God and fulfilled God's purpose for humanity to co-rule with God for the good of others. And the life of Jesus and really all of human history came to its climax at the moment when the power and authority of Jesus was used in the most selfless way. When the perfect image of God went to the cross, laying down his entire life for the image bearers of God who only used their power and authority to destroy and to kill. And in that moment, it felt like once again, Human beings had used their power and authority to define good and evil for themselves, and evil had won as the good and beautiful Son of God was killed at human hands. But this wasn't the end of the story, because three days later, when Jesus rose from the dead, He unleashed something new into the world that no one ever expected. It was the end of one story and the beginning of a brand new one. You see, Jesus died on Friday, the sixth day of creation, the day when human beings were created in the image of God to co-rule beside God. And then Jesus rested in the grave on the seventh day, the same day that God rested in the creation narrative. And when Jesus rose on Sunday, it wasn't just the first day of another week that would be just like every other week before, where human beings were forced to play out some broken narrative of defining good and evil for themselves and choosing evil more than they chose good. Instead, the early Christians began to refer to Sunday as the eighth day of creation, 
It was the day when Jesus unleashed God's new creation work in the world that would one day culminate in Jesus returning to put an end to all evil and suffering once and for all. Jesus' resurrection unleashed God's resurrection power into the world so that anyone who would choose to follow Jesus and trust in Him, meaning trust that what He says is best, really is best, Trust that His definition of good and evil are more important than my definition of good and evil. Trust that His death and resurrection made it possible for me to die to my old, sinful, broken, evil self and be resurrected to new life in Him. Anyone who would trust in Jesus would not die, but would have everlasting life. And this isn't just about your afterlife. Jesus means that we could enter into the eternal life of heaven, the life of the new creation that God is bringing right here and right now. One of the early followers of Jesus named Paul wrote about this new creation process of Jesus by stating, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. Or some translations say, they are a new creation. They have joined in Christ's new creation work. The old has gone and the new is here. Jesus didn't just come to show us a better way to do life, but to offer us a brand new life, a brand new way to be humans, a way to be free of our sin and evil and to fully embody the image of God just as we were always meant to do. Now, because Jesus loves us so much, He doesn't force Himself on us. He allows us to opt in to his new creation work. We can choose whether or not we want new life in his kingdom where he is king and we follow his definition of good and evil. But if we do, our lives, they can be radically transformed. The Apostle Paul once wrote, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, which is what all of us have done our entire lives. We've just bought into the lie that we get to define what good and evil are for ourselves but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. It's an inside out transformation when you choose to accept that Jesus is king, that he's right about everything, that his definition of good and evil matters more than your own, and you trust him enough to actually do what he says. If you do that again and again, day after day, then you'll be a completely new person. And I know that kind of sounds like wishful thinking or some kind of self-help nonsense, but you only think that because you haven't seen it. You haven't been with the people I, I have who have had real experiences with Jesus and would say, you know, I used to be one way and now I'm completely different. And it isn't just age and maturity that changed them because if you haven't figured it out, time doesn't give you wisdom. All it does is make you old. But through my relationships here at Community Christian, I know people who were once trapped in patterns of destructive and harmful behavior that wrecked their lives and their integrity and their relationships, but now they live lives of meaning and joy and freely, easily love people who they once would have called their enemies. I know marriages that were filled with infidelity that are now full of love and trust and faithfulness. I know families that were defined by chaos and turmoil and pain. And now they're full of peace and wholeness. And I know my own story. I was once a lustful, porn addicted, bitter, selfish, workaholic liar who hid the truth about myself from everyone and I hurt those closest to me. But over the past 12 years, Jesus has radically changed me to someone who would be unrecognizable to me or my wife or anyone close to me all those years ago. I have a peace and a genuine compassion and love for others that never existed before. I work to be honest and transparent about my flaws and my failures and to speak the truth even when it costs me something. And I have a relationship with the God who made me where he speaks to me and I speak to him about what we're both doing together. And that's not because I'm older. It's because I've opted into the new creation work of Jesus and he's changing me from the inside out. He's removing all the sin and evil from my life and he's bringing out the beautiful image of God from within me. 
but it takes daily choosing to trust him and his definition of good and evil and not my own. It takes renewing my mind and dying to my old ways of being human and being born again into a new life of love in Jesus. And I don't expect this one video to convince you of this. I don't really even think it can. I think the only way you'll be convinced of this is if you step out of isolation and into community. That's why we say around here all the time that church is not meant to be content you consume, but a community you can be committed to because Jesus is not inviting you into a classroom to learn about him. He's inviting you into his new creation work and a key part of his new creation is this new family of God where we learn what it means to love everyone always together. We practice with each other and then we take it out to the world around us. And if you want to know if the new life of Jesus actually works, then you have to get up close and personal with some people who have seen it work in their lives. And so I'd like to personally invite you to join our community here. You can text the word JOIN to the number you see on screen. And I'd love to talk with you about how we can get you in a community where you can see God's work in action. Or you can go to the website on screen, cccanywhere.com, and click the card that says, join our Facebook group. If you do that, you'll be redirected to our online community where you can connect with others from around the country who are experiencing the new life of love that Jesus offers. Do not end this video without taking a step because Jesus is offering you a new way to be you, the you that you were always meant to be, a you that isn't a mixture of good and bad, but a you that is a mixture of God and you. It's a beautiful thing, but you need a community to help you figure it out. So reach out right now and we'll walk with you. But as you leave today, I hope you know that no matter what you choose or what you think about God, he can't stop thinking about you.